India is actually, it's full of pastoralist cultures and you find them everywhere. You find them in the Himalayas and you find them in Tamil Nadu, you find them in the western deserts and you find them in Odisha and you find them on the Deccan Plateau. So they are an extremely prominent group of people but officially they do not exist. Officially, there's no category pastoralism, pastoralists. And the people from the agricultural sciences say subsume them under farmers. And for me, they're not farmers because the pastors do not cultivate crops. They don't till the soil, they don't put seeds in the ground, they don't harvest. Well, they do harvest, but basically they make use of resources that are there anyway. They're making use either of wild vegetation or of crop residues. So they don't, uh, there's basically no inputs. You don't need any energy to, uh, you know, to, uh, to till the land. You don't need any energy to bring feed to them. Um, everything is really produced. It's a no carbon uh, economy. And Unfortunately, so the, the establishment has no concept of pastoralists and not just a few years ago, the ex uh, DDG of um, the animal husbandry department on yeah, the animal husbandry of the Krishi Bahan, he said to me when I gave a presentation, he said to me, Madam, in your country you may have pastoralists, in India we have only farmers. So, uh, so, so this is it, the, the irony on, on one um, on one side. And the other irony is that they they often they are also categorized as nomads. And the Commission on Nomadic Tribes they write about these people as being uh, economically very marginalized and so on. But. In actual fact, these people are an economic powerhouse. They contribute immensely to India's uh, economy and to the foreign currency uh, exchange. India is the largest um, exporter of sheep and goat meat in the world and it practically feeds uh, a lot of Arab countries and uh, the sheep and goat meat. In addition to that, there's always Actually, this preoccupation among the agricultural establishment with our livestock being unproductive and um, in need of upgrading, and we need to, uh, our animals, our cows give so little milk, we need to um, uh, make them better. Whereas, in actual fact, India is also the world's largest milk producer, and it's the largest exporter of beef, which is actually mostly <coughs> buffalo meat, and it's feeding Southeast Asia and the Arab countries. And we don't have exact figures, but the majority of these products are actually generated by pastoralists in traditional systems with hardly any resource inputs and just by harvesting naturally available biomass. And these, I mean, I'm, I don't like the word traditional because these systems are also con continuously adapting, you know, they're not uh, static or so, they're continuously changing their ways and, and taking advantage of new opportunities. So they, de they depend on the local indigenous trees and they graze on natural biodiverse vegetation and crop after mass and it's kind of, a, we have to look at it in a systems way, you know, these are systems of people, vegetations and specific animal genetic resources which have different qualities and um, the breeds that the most officials aim for, you know, the highly productive breeds. These animals can walk very far, they can take drought, they don't mind if they don't get anything to eat for a while, they can go without water for a long time, uh, they can take very high temperature, very cold temperatures, etc. Et and one important uh, aspect of these production systems is also that there's a balance between the livestock numbers and available resources. There's always this talk about pastoralists overgrazing and destroying the vegetation. But that actually also doesn't really hold up uh, to scrutiny. Because if there's not enough uh, to eat for the, for the livestock, 
then 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 the next season there will be less um, you know the reproductive rate goes down there will be less kids or, or lambs born and actually because we have such a fluctuation in rainfall you know sometimes we have a lot of rainfall sometimes we have very little so actually in you know then the, the livestock numbers go down but there's a lot of vegetation and it's actually not even made use of uh, another very important point is that these systems are also very uh, much interlinked with biodiversity, including wildlife biodiversity. You always find life, uh, wildlife where there are um, pastures as well. So, which is a, a, an irony that always, you know, where because the biodiversity is there, then somebody wants to put in a protected area in a national park but it, and then kick out the pastures, where it's actually. Um, the reason for the biodiversity are the pastoralists. Um, yeah, degrading the land and one enormously important role of um, the pastoralists is also that they contribute a lot of manure, a lot of organic fertilizer. And in the Indian uh, soils, uh, many of the Indian soils don't take the chemical fertilizer, they uh, it makes them uh, sterile after a while, but they need the organic manure, and many farmers really appreciate it. Um, yeah, so very often the, the livestock actually they graze in the forest, they take up the nutrients, and they go to the fields, and then they kind of put the nutrients from the forest into the field and sustain agriculture. So the pastures are really important for sustaining um, crop fertility. And uh, another point is that without pastoralism, you couldn't utilize a lot of remote areas like the alpine pastures in the, in the Himalaya. So all these systems are just based on, on the mobility and on the ability of these animals to long, go long uh, distances. And one point which is really um, important is that pastoralism is a way of producing food without destroying the uh, natural biodiversity. Because pastoral animals, they actually harvest all these different plants. They're like, kind of like a combined harvester, you know, which is modular. You know, they can go up the hills and go down the hills and, to, in, uh, you know, along the roadside, everywhere. It can just, it just harvest, you know. And you never need to buy a new one because they reproduce by themselves. You know, they don't need any fuel. I mean, they're just a brilliant thing. And, in Rajasthan, people actually say that um, the camel and the goat eat 36 different types of um, plants. And this actually has very important implications also for the nutritional value of um, the, the food that's produced in these pastoral systems. Because if you, you know, it makes a difference whether your animal is fed on, uh, you know, cotton seed, uh, expeller from GM crops or whether it grazes on all these biodiverse plants. And if you eat the products, you drink the milk from uh, these animals which graze on all these trees, which many of them have medicinal value. They use some traditional medicine actually. And then you know your animal eats it and it kind of distills all the you know the good qualities of those plants into the milk. And which is one of the reasons why camel milk for instance is now there's a, a market building up for camel milk for autistic children. Autistic children respond really well even to small doses of camel milk. And um, the Rajasthan government has said, you know, it's not possible to make camel milk a marketing viable. But recently a company has been set up here in Delhi and they're selling camel milk for 600 rupees a liter. And they're shipping it uh, throughout um, India. Um, however, all these things, you know, all these good aspects about pastoral have not remained, they haven't been visible and they haven't been studied. Maybe by some anthropologist here or there, but not by any of these livestock scientists. So the, the, the vision of, you know, the official vision of livestock futures in India is like the American, the Western system. We have huge, uh, you know, stables filled with, um, genetically totally homogeneous uh, populations which can only you know produce 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 so what to do about this yeah. um, 
Yeah, so coming to some of the, the solutions is, I mean, the first step I think is to that we recognize and acknowledge the value of the traditional systems. We need to document them, and even if documentation sometimes isn't, uh, you know, looked at as that positively, as it's really important just to generate visibility. We need to facilitate and support the mobility of the pastoralists. We, we need to see that as something positive and not as something negative. We need to protect the pastors. The, the Rajasthan pastors, for instance, they have huge problems. They are organized because the value of um, there's so much demand for mutton that you know there are these dacoits and seeds out there. So they regularly get attacked in the night by organized gangs who just lift their sheep, and nobody is you know the police couldn't really care less. So so they they need some kind of protection, and especially we need to you know, have some kind of um, planning, uh, you know, landscape planning where we leave some space for the, the pastoralists and we need to protect their uh, customary rights. And um, there is actually a tool or an approach that has been developed uh, recently, which is called the Biocultural Community Protocol. And this is actually a tool which has some legal validity it comes out of the Nagoya Protocol of the um, Con Convention on Biological Diversity, which actually makes it mandatory for governments to, uh, for communities to establish their protocols. So these bioculture protocols have been established already for four or five groups in India, pastoralist groups, and they put on record, you know, their role in biodiversity conservation. But we also want to add now their role in food security. We want to put into these documents how much these guys actually uh, produce to, to give it more strength because policymakers don't care that much about biodiversity but they care much more about uh, food security. So, uh, my vision <laughs> for 2025 is that India is going to be the one country that's going to you know, turn the global thinking about livestock around and that it's going to do that on the basis of this tremendous uh, pastoralist heritage, which I think is unique in the world. Uh, India has maybe more pastoralists than any other country, but nobody knows about it, you know. If somebody asks how many pastoralists are there in India, they don't get an answer, so pastoralists don't exist. And what's really important would be that, you know, the positive role of these pastoralists and the they have in, in conserving biodiversity and in making use of the natural resources are rewarded, that they are recognized as providers of agro-ecosystem services. Another vision would be that, you know, that the, we have, like we have with the cotton, that we have local processing of the livestock products into regional specialty foods and into apparel, you could do things out of wool and so on. And you know, we need to keep livestock as part of, of nature. So, you know, livestock keeping should be combined with nature conservation into one kind of profession, and then it would become attractive to the, the young people as well. Um, and maybe even to young people from non pastoralist backgrounds, like I could really imagine. So, um, these are just some of the products. <laughs> so that's it. Yeah. Thanks, you said it was Okay, uh, just three things. Uh, one is the thing that you said about livestock numbers not increasing. The livestock numbers? Not increasing. That, that people often say that livestock numbers are increasing and it creates a problem. Uh, it, it's, in Ladakh, we actually looked at numbers and there have been increases over the last 30 years, unless I misunderstood what you said. Uh, and also uh, a change in the kind of livestock that's been kept because the, the uh, goat, the Pashmina goat. Exactly. Yeah. That's why they've been increasing. Yeah. So uh, that's one. Uh, the second was uh, the kind of education that the children uh, have been getting from these families. Uh, it, it actually takes them away from the entire lifestyle. Uh, and again in Ladakh there was this, for a brief while, uh, the, the head council did try 
and then I mean have the system where the teachers moved with the families, but that failed. But it failed because the teachers were not from the community and found living in that kind of lifestyle extremely hard. Uh, so now they built residential schools for these children, and uh, I think that's the same kind of issues that Adivasi children face when they live in, in hostels through the year. Uh, it's, it's the same thing that's happening. And now the Champas, they kind of report that it's only the older people who are interested in keeping this lifestyle going. And the younger, the youth and the younger ones don't want to go back to it. The second and the third is just uh, a concern with the increasing uh, the increasing organization that's taking place, uh, our cities are growing and expanding and uh, that would be impacting the common spaces that the nomadic groups were using earlier. I don't think you know. What was the last uh, question I didn't share? Uh, urban spaces. Urban spaces. Urban spaces. Yes, yes, yes. And, yeah, and linked to that is the the, the fact that a lot of urban people just do not understand uh, nomadism. If you're saying officials don't, that was actually, that actually shocked me. But I do know that people who live, a lot of people who live in our cities don't quite understand the needs of uh, the pastoralists. Uh, I just wanted to know your experience of uh, after. Okay. Is it okay? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, what were, what has been your experience in positioning the uh, PCP uh, of the pastoralist community to the you know different stakeholders, and uh, has it been able to you know make a difference in the lives of the communities that you work with? Okay. One, thing, one of the things that, that I, I think we should mention is, is the capacity of, of pastoral communities to, to, well, let's say, to exploit variability. I mean, they enjoy the variability that, and they thrive on that. And whereas this, the sedentary farming communities are, are, let's say, vulnerable to variability. So there's, there's a way in which the state has to, well, see and appreciate the variability. I think that's, that's something that we've discussed before. The, 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 the policy blindness to, 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 the, to the herding tracts and the questions of conflict are also something that, that need to be addressed. And the conflict is, is different in, in different regions, but as in some states, some um, farmers, for instance, in Kutunar area in, in Kerala, they look forward to the duck herds that come in and they want the, the herds, um, the, the flocks, in, in their fields. Um, in some areas, they're not welcome anymore because the crops have changed. Like, you know, with trucks that were open fields have become grapes or, you know, gone into horticultural crops and the herds are no longer welcome. Um, the, the relationship between between pastoral communities and and poverty in villages is, is also something that, that needs discussion. And I think that that has to come out in the ways in which well, certain exchange mechanisms do promote, uh, well, livestock keeping in villages with the help of pastoral Systems. Um, I'll let you talk about that. Yeah. Uh, the one about education, Shweta uh, has already spoken about, but at the same time, if you're talking about also shrinking opportunities in pastoralism in the long run, if that is likely to happen, of course, your vision says that it will increase. Uh, but if it is likely to happen, then what happens to the next generation from pastoralist families? since they are nomadic by nature. Uh, the second is the issue of citizenship rights, which is actually an issue with a lot of uh, nomadic communities, where they don't seem to be grounded, they're not on record in any of the villages in many states. So what about their citizenship rights, particularly when it comes access to government welfare programs, etc., etc.? That, you know, life, livestock usually uh, um, includes cows, and cows was the missing animal in your entire discourse of the goat being cow. Uh, the sacred cow, which is a cultural 
issue. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, I understand that the cow is related to domestic, you know, settled production and is not part of the pastoralist herd. Uh, but or maybe, but it was not mentioned at all. And I was just wondering whether it is worth a mention, given that it's so culturally iconic. Yeah, I just wanted to. Uh, there's a um, complementary process to the what's come out of the Nyoga uh, Protocol. Something called the attempt to draft a global declaration on the rights of peasants. It's been going on for the last four years at the United Nations Human Rights Council. And so there's a that, that we need to recognize the rights of small farmers, pastoralists, fisherfolk. Uh, including the, their land rights, um, including uh, the recognition of the uh, migration routes, you know, which are being sort of taken over by development projects and so on. Uh, so that might be uh, something worth looking at. And in addition to what Sujata was saying, I, I just wanted to also bring up the issue of women's rights and discrimination and violence against women within the community, if anything is being done about that, because there have been some very serious cases. What? Violence on women in the world. This is the only place in Rajasthan. But there is a lot of work in our country. In other countries, in Uttarakhand, Gujar and Bhagri Palak. एक जमाने में बकरी पालक चीन तक का व्यापार हो करते थे चीन जब बासठ की लड़ाई से पहले पूरा ये भूटिया मार्चा कई कम्युनिटीयां जो वहां जाती थी लेकिन अब उनका धंधा दो तीन कारणों से गड़बड़ हो रहा है एक तो जो नेशनल पार्क बन रहे हैं बन रहे हैं बायोस्पेयर बन रहे हैं तो उनको बड़ी मुश्किलों का सामना करना पड़ता है दूसरे में ये बहुत पूरे देश में अभी बहुत कुछ काम करने की जरूरत है क्योंकि ये ये पूरा उजड़ रहे जंगल उजड़ रहे हैं इन पर बड़ा संकट है मतलब चारे की कमी होती जा रही है सारी चीजें हैं ये एक और कुछ ज्यादा काम करने की जरूरत है मुझे लगता है और ये हमारी संस्कृति से जुड़ा हुआ जो पशुधन का हिस्सा है हमारे उत्तराखंड में भी सबसे पहले खेती का काम बाद में शुरू हुआ हम लोग खेती बाद में करने लगे हमारे फोर फादर एक तरह से पशु पालन के हैं और ये प्रकृति के बड़े मित्र होते हैं आ, आप देखिए एक ही जगह अगर पशु रहेगा तो बहुत ज्यादा नुकसान होता है घूम घूम के जाते हैं छह महीने वहाँ आराम किया छह महीने यहाँ uh, you know, you, we, the, the, the animals feed on crop residues and they feed on white vegetation. Now, I can imagine farmers welcoming them because, you know, for the manure if, after the field is harvested. But now with the cash crop, now for example, BT cotton, uh, you know, the, the fodder value of which is reduced, the feed would decline there. In terms of uh, wild uh, vegetation, you know, you have your commons uh, being enclosed and degraded. So there you have a degradation process coming in. So taking these into factors, do you think perhaps, you know, the, the, the pastoralists need to be a bit more proactive in terms of, uh, uh, you know, strengthening their future? I don't know, in terms of getting more organized, in terms of even uh, after a cycle of uh, uh, Raising, you know, to do some planting, regeneration of fodders, especially perennial fodders. So it's a kind of a thing which then becomes a, a, a far more environmentally <coughs> regenerative as well. I this uh, government schizophrenic policies, you know, like wheat ban, banning banning slaughter of cow family, <laughs> will actually decimate the pastoral economy. Yeah. So, so that gets probably is a so that's it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, the increase in uh, goats, and it's due to that demand for pashmina, so I think that's an exceptional situation. But the uh, population in India is going down gradually. So, um, education, um, uh, mobile education, yes, very important, but very difficult. I can't really say anything to that. And urbanization, people don't understand. Yes. It's, that's that's totally right. I mean, urban people have lost the connection, and they they all these animal welfare people who then implement the bans, which are totally counterproductive, both for the 
the animal, I mean, there's a camel, for instance, the camel has become a state animal, and there's a ban on its slaughter, but that, I mean, that's, that's what is finally killing it off. So, uh, then the positioning of PCPs, the difference in life, you know, that's a very difficult question, and the PCP is not a magic bullet, but it's, it's a, like one arrow in your arsenal of, you know, approaches you have to change things, and I think it's a very a powerful one. And, but the message is still under development, and I think we need to kind of increase the scope of the PCPs going beyond biodiversity and enduring food security, as he talked about biodiversity. What uh, Bajesh Bahishay said about the uh, exploiting variability, that's a very important point. I mean, exactly. I mean, it's the only way of, of using the landscape if you have a lot of variability in, in rainfall. And several times we had this term climate chaos being heard here. And if anybody can cope with climate chaos, it's the pastoralists, I mean, because they are so adaptive and, and they have so many strategies to cope. Conflict situation, that's very true. It depends. It depends. <coughs> so they are very much um, look forward to the pastures because they leave the manure. In others, they are not. They are squeezed out of the crop cycle, especially if you have a BT cotton crops or so. But um, but I think I mean the, the I think the, the manure argument is a huge one, and so far nobody actually has put a figure on that. You know how much money we are, you know. And, India is importing a lot of urea, you know, at an enormous cost, and it, it's not getting enough of it. But and but we have no figures for the amount of manure that's actually deposited on the field. And if we, you know, if we have figures and we can hammer them in, I think they will eventually be heard. And then you actually you also create the basis for uh, organic agriculture, and, and the farmers could get a higher value then for their uh, uh, products. Pastures and poverty. Actually, pastors are not poor. They are absolutely not poor, and they don't need micro credit because they have always access. They can sell a few animals. They have. They can have cash any time. The middlemen. I mean, the, the traders are running after them because there's so much demand for for mutton. I mean, they're practically grabbing the animals from them. So, um, um, and it's a self-producing asset. You know. I mean, you have one. Today you have three or four next year. Um, citizenship is, I mean, among the classes which I work with, it's not a problem. They all have their cards. I know, like, because they, they need permits and so on. And so most of them are, are registered. And cows, I'm sorry, I left them out. That was just totally unintentional. <laughs> we have cow, we have lots of cattle nomads uh, as well. And um, then about the women's rights, you know, I don't think that's a more a problem in pastoral than in any other community. I really, I cannot say that the pastoral women are very strong. No, They're, I mean, they have to deal with it as well, of course. Sorry? Every community has to deal with roughly issues of privacy and violence. And this yeah. 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 How are they? I don't think there's anything special for pastoralists or that in yeah. How is it dealt with? Is there any progress? No, I mean, it's, they're terribly back from the conservative the groups that I know. Yes, it's, it, it, it's, it's absolutely true. Um, yeah, they don't, some of the pastors, they don't want the girls to be educated. They don't want an educated bride or something in their house. That's, that's, but that's yeah. a different thing. Um, and then, what else? Yes, uh, what Vijay was saying, um, Ashu Palak, Okay, Upa, go ahead, or come, it's a holy day. Yes. <laughs> so I think that's it. We have to cover the beef band. Well, the, the beef band. Yeah, right. you no, know, I, I didn't cover it. Yeah, I mean, the the beef and the camel. The cam yeah. So thanks. That was the uh, <laughs> Yeah. And then when we are in the